Indian certificate that has been granted by uh, the industrial court, for example, at TSTT, at um, the Tourism Development Company, and at Petro Trin and so on, where the government uh, took certain actions without really meeting and treating mm -hmm. and adhering to the principles of good industrial relations practices as outlined by the um, Industrial Relations Act and so on. For example, with the closure of uh, Petro Trin, mm -hmm. the government was supposed to appoint two union representatives to a restructuring committee that would have worked out a way forward for Petro Trin for 18 months, over a period of 18 months. And uh, in spite of the uh, agreement or the memorandum of understanding which was signed by the union and uh, the management of Petro Trin, mm -hmm. this was never adhered to, um, it was never honored, and uh, the government took an alternative route, really imposing the might of the cabinet on the, the management of Petrotrain and up till today there can be no study to point in a direction because there were a number of studies in fact Petrotrain yeah. spent over 63 million dollars in consultancy and up till today uh, we cannot be told where the recommendation came to close down Petrotrain and uh, for example in TSTT2 mm -hmm. The, um, not TSCT, sorry, but the Tourism Development Company. There was what we would call um, a decision that was taken by the cabinet. Again, there was no meeting with the union to, um, in keeping with the uh, clauses in the collective agreement that would have focused on restructuring and so on. Yeah. And uh, again, the decision was taken to close without uh, exploring options and so on. So this is why in the industrial relations arena, there's the term that uh, uh, union busting has come about. You get rid of the union and then you rehire on uh, what we would call contract labor and terms and conditions mm -hmm. that doesn't adhere to collective bargaining, doesn't allow union participation and uh, uh, from time to time, uh, there's absolutely no uh, what you would call collective bargaining process and, and no collective and, agreement. And, and speaking of contract labor, um, what we have seen over time is a, a trend, I should say, um, a shift away from permanent labor into contract labor. Um, do you think that this is perhaps bigger than it really is in this country? I mean, if you look at many companies that are shutting down or doing restructuring. It has always been a shift away from permanency to contract labor. How does this now impact um, not just the trade union itself, but workers themselves? Well, certainly it, 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 it impacts uh, negatively on the whole uh, on, on employees because of financial institution take a very dim view mm -hmm. of uh, persons when they are not what we would call engaged in sustainable employment or permanent uh, employment. Because for example, when, uh, when employees approach financial institutions to um, secure um, arrangements as it, uh, um, as it relates to what we would call long-term uh, financial sustainability, whether you a want to engage instance. or enter into a mortgage arrangement mm -hmm. which focuses on your housing or acquisition of a vehicle mm -hmm. or um, children's education or sometimes emergency funding for uh, health situations of a critical nature and so on. Um, financial institutions take the position that uh, you are not uh, in a sustainable job, you cannot repay um, this uh, mortgage arrangement and you are left uh, out in the cold. Um, also from the point of view of uh, contract labor does not allow, for example, um, 
individuals to what we would call uh, improve their terms and conditions with the employer yeah. on a, a continuous basis in terms of reviewing, for example, whether it is your daily rate, hourly rate, your monthly um, compensation packages. Um, in most instances, it doesn't, um, there's little room for what we would call pension plans and uh, group health plans and so on. Um, so there's a negative um, scenario connotation to contract labor. And if um, it is not dealt with where there are minimum terms and conditions where contract labor um, exists, mm -hmm. uh, then it will definitely not augur well in the interest of, of the worker. Ms. Larson, if I could just ask you your take on the importance of labor reform in this country. Um, I know it's something that has been touted about for the past few years um, by trade unions, by government, by opposition. What is your take on labor reform and how critical is it for this country? Well, any society uh, has to reform with, with time. You, it changes inescapable with the passage of time and uh, labor is a particular facet of, of our society in terms of the uh, economy and so on so from a legislative point of view mm -hmm. there will always be the need to amend your labor laws to deal with scenarios and so on as it continues to unfold whether it is from the collective bargaining process whether it is from uh, the registration, recognition, and certification of unions, um, whether it is from an occupational safety and health point of view. Um, and in recent times, you see a number of companies have gone belly up, and um, the whole debate continues to rage on, on when a company goes belly up in yeah. terms of financial liabilities, who must be uh, in terms of first in the line in terms of how uh, the persons must or the uh, individual or stakeholders when the company go belly up who is the person should first and foremost receive his or her uh, liability and in this instance you have been uh, we have seen with the loss of over 50,000 jobs in the country mm -hmm. in the last four years you have seen a, an outcry for um, the settlement of worker liabilities to be placed high up on the agenda. Then there is also the whole question of um, productivity will always uh, be part and parcel of uh, an ongoing debate on, on labor reform and how do you get the uh, workers, how you do get the uh, labor to become more pro uh, productive. Yeah then you will always uh, want to address the whole questions of uh, the labor market and skills in relation to the needs of the economy and the productive sector and so on. And then from the, what I, uh, for example, in the state sector too, you would also want to look at, from a tri tripartite point of view, uh, the involvement of labor, the involvement of the business community and so on to issues such as when companies go belly up, when the economy is contracting mm -hmm. and employment is rising, uh, do you create the establishment or, or do you create um, something that is called unemploy unemployment insurance fund and so on? Uh, also from the point of view of um, the current national insurance system or the social security system, mm -hmm. there needs to be some kind of critical analysis and reform in terms of how do we go forward with it. Recently, you would have heard from the executive director of the National Insurance Fund that if certain uh, policy positions are not taken, um, it can go in, in the red by 2030. Yeah. You would have heard of for the need of a capital injection of approximately $50 billion and so on to keep this fund going. So there are a number of dimensions in the context of uh, uh, IR industrial relations uh, that needs to be addressed in terms of review, amending, coming up with 
new scenarios and so on. Even the whole question of um, contract labor, uh, as we just uh, discussed a couple mm -hmm. moments ago, in terms of if, if, if uh, contract labor, does it address the question of uh, a decent work agenda? Trinidad and Tobago, for example, is a signatory to the International Labor Organization. We send delegations of a tripartite nature to the International Labor Organization on an annual basis. And uh, the, the, the conventions and the recommendations which are um, agreed to um, at the, the level of this international body um, is left wanting, is left hanging, it is not implemented and so on at a local level and it is not linked with our national labor laws. Mm -hmm. Very interesting point there. Um, something I wanted to touch on a, a little bit, um, it would be the introduction of a bill to give members of parliament uh, the magistracy and um, I believe it's judges increased pensions and mm -hmm. the attorney general says you know he makes no apology in increasing the pension for those um, the higher ups um, in society where when uh, it's a situation where you have the working class has been clamoring for pension plans for what is rightly due uh, for them over the past a uh, number of years but here you have a bill that came I want to use this term loosely overnight and it seems like the working class has again been forgotten what are your thoughts on that well um, the Attorney General belongs to a government uh, headed by Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley uh, that has really disrespected uh, the labor movement betrayed the labor movement and at the end of the day I think the population will judge them based on the commitments that they made in their manifesto from a labor point of view and also from the uh, angle of the uh, memorandum of understanding which was signed by with the labor movement prior to the general election of 2015 and pension plans or, or the whole question of, of instituting pension plans and portability of pension plans and so on were part of a, a commitment that was given by the government of Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley. Mm -hmm. And uh, the opposition is of the, of the view that uh, pensions are part and parcel of what we would call uh, the dignity of a worker and part of the decent work agenda that is articulated by the International Labour Organization. But at the end of the day, one has, uh, so a worker is a worker at all levels and so on. And you need to have a proper compensation package and part of that compensation package are pension arrangement. But at a time when the economy is not growing, at a time when the economy is uh, contracting, mm -hmm. at a time when uh, um, workers, especially at the hourly and daily rated uh, scenario dimension of the workforce in this country they have not been able to settle their collective agreements I think it was obscene uh, in the way that the government approached this particular issue um, for example if we look at the daily rated workers the hourly and daily rated workers in the local government sector and at the level of the Tobago House of Assembly. They have been clamoring for uh, uh, a pension plan to be a fruition. In fact, uh, somewhere in 1994, their representative union, the National Union of Government and Federated Workers, signed an agreement with the then Manning administration, which reduced uh, the retirement age at the level of the daily rated uh, component of government from 65 to 60 years and there was a commitment to implement a pension plan mm -hmm. and uh, so at the 12 regional corporations which is represented by the national union of government and federated workers and the san fernando city corporation which is 
uh, represented by the contractors and general workers trade union and the Port of Spain City Corporation, which is represented by the Amalgamated Workers Union and uh, the workers at the Tobago House of Assembly level, uh, represented again by Nuge, these workers have not been able to see the light of a uh, pension plan from a daily rated uh, collective bargaining point of view. And also in other areas of, of the state sector and even in the private sector and so on, uh, workers are clamoring for pension. Workers are clamoring for what we would call group health plans and so on. And this is why um, the opposition took the position in this particular, in terms of our approach to debating and our final position when it came to voting on the legislation, that it was obscene, it was uncaring, and uh, the government was merely seeking to improve uh, their benefits at a time when uh, the, the reality is that the collective bargaining process is, has not worked for uh, the, the mass uh, amount of, of workers in the society. I know you've also been very vocal about the um, much touted about increase or, or something that the government w was in talks about, um, increasing the age for retirement from 60 to 65. Well, this goes back to the whole question of the current financial status of the national insurance system in the country. I made the point early on that, and if you read, there's a, a, a recommend, uh, an, a, the latest actuarial valuation report, the 10th actuarial valuation report of the national insurance system, mm -hmm. which came out in June of 2016 and on page um, 94, I do not have it in front of me at the moment, but if my memory can uh, serve me correctly this morning. I think it is on page 94. Right. There are a number of recommendations made by the actuaries as it relates to this 10 um, actuarial valuation report. And uh, there are fundamentally, uh, I think, three major policy positions which the government must uh, consider in going forward. Mm -hmm. And this is why we continue to call out uh, the Minister of Finance and by extension the Prime Minister, we want to know what is the government position on the way forward. It calls for, again, an increase in national insurance contribution from the point of view of the worker and the employer. And certainly when uh, national insurance contributions are increased in terms of uh, the burden of responsibility on employers, this will be passed on to the consumer from the point of view of uh, an increased cost of production. Then there was the recommendation that the retirement age will be moved from 60 to 65, mm -hmm. and there would be an incremental reduction of your uh, national insurance contribution uh, by approximately 30% on, on uh, a yearly basis in terms of the statistics we are seeing, the data we are seeing. And that is why we are saying uh, this is our position in terms of we want to know and we want to warn the workers that there seems to be some kind of orchestrated plan on the part of the government to dismantle the national insurance system. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, um, how much we the, the workforce that is the existing workforce and also those who are to come on to the, the system should at least have some clarity there should be some transparency and openness to tell the population what is the true financial position of the national insurance system what is the capital injection that is needed to keep the fund afloat based on the payout that is projected and we, again, asked the question as it related to this but the debate in the parliament recently, why, why the government took the decision that uh, migrant, and in this instance, all seems to be pointing in the direction of the uh, amount of Venezuelans that are in Trinidad and Tobago 
based on the amnesty and the registration process yeah. that was allowed by the, the government of Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley. Why the government took the position at a time that we are hearing from all the experts, all the commentators, that there was the need for financial uh, revenue, there was the need for more contributions to the national insurance system, and why the government took the position that all uh, migrant and in this instance Venezuelan workers who are here, that if they are employed for the next year, they will not have to contribute any national insurance mm -hmm. contribution to the system and so on. Do you think perhaps there's a bigger picture behind it? Well, um, we, we, there seems to be, uh, well, the whole question of uh, the, the, the presence of the Venezuela nationals in Trinidad and Tobago has been bungled from the point of view by this government from a policy position. Up till today, there is no clear-cut policy that has been enunciated. We do not know if these nationals who are here are migrant workers, asylum seekers, refugee mm -hmm. uh, seeking refugees. Nothing has been declared so, so far. Yeah. That has not been clarified. There are a number of contradictory statements, whether it is from the Prime Minister, the Minister of National Security, and a very silent Minister of um, Foreign Affairs, Foreign and CARICOM Affairs. Even the Minister of Labor recently stepped out of a crease to make a, a little pronouncement that there was the need for the protection of migrant workers. And if you are protecting migrant workers, then you need to invoke your, your there needs to be a proper policy, there needs to be what we would call uh, the quality of, of, of treatment and opportunity. There's a convention um, that is uh, recognized by the international labor organization uh, in terms of how you treat migrant workers in any geographic space and in addition to that whether this will be tied to our national labor laws and so on whether it is from uh, the industrial relations act whether it is from the occupational safety and health act um, the, even the national insurance system and so on so again um, i do not know too and I would hate to think that the government is sending a signal to the business community, their uh, friends and financiers, to, in, in a very subtle way, in a very clandestine manner, to sideline uh, Trinidadian nationals in your workplace and give preference to uh, Venezuelan nationals. Because from an employer point of view, you will not have the responsibility of having to pay national insurance contribution for persons who are working in your establishment. All right, we're just about one minute to go before we wrap things up for this um, this section of wake-up call here. Uh, Mr. Indara Singh, if I can just ask you your closing comments. Well, uh, my, my closing comments are that uh, the government of Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley has betrayed, they have brutalized, they have gone back on every commitment that they have made to the labor movement in terms of improving their terms and conditions of employment and addressing policy issues, addressing broader issues that were committed to prior to the general elections of 2015. And the opposition, the political party, which I belong to, led by Kamala Prasad Bisesa, certainly uh, is prepared to engage not only the labor movement but the business community in uh, addressing a number of the issues as it relates to not only from a labor point of view but from a point of view that will augur well towards the overall economic growth and development of Trinidad and Tobago beyond 2020. All right, there you go. Uh, there you have it, folks. Um, it's a very interesting um, information coming out there from Mr. Indara Singh, the member, uh, opposition member of parliament. Mr. Indara Singh, thank you so much for joining us this thank morning. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So we're going to toss to news and come back with more. Um, coming up after news, we've got discussions on negotiations the way forward. So stay with us.